few minutes after midnight on October 26th, 2018, I had Red Dead Redemption 2 in my hands. After a little more than two years of waiting, from the first red Rockstar logo, to the six drip-fed trailers, and through the two incredibly painful year-long delays, the sequel, or rather prequel, to Red Dead Redemption was in my hands. I think it's safe to say that Red Dead Redemption 2 was my most anticipated game, and to date that feat remains unbeaten. By October 2018, it had been five years since Rockstar's last game, and over eight years since Red Dead Redemption. I was ready to explore another Rockstar world, and I was ready to witness the earlier days of the Vandalink Gang. Little did I know the impact that this game would have on me. Over the last two years, I've played Red Dead Redemption 2 more than I've played any other game in my life. I've replayed the story more times than any much smaller indie game, and I've explored its virtual world far longer than I've cared to experience some real life ones. And yet, when I step away from the game, I can't wait to go back and do it again. It's consumed me like no other piece of entertainment ever has. And, if only to answer this question for myself, or perhaps also to justify to my family why my obsession with this game is not completely insane, I'd like to explore why. This is not a review of Red Dead Redemption 2, nor is this a video essay with objective research-based reasoning into the game's successes or flaws. No, this is why Red Dead Redemption 2 is perfect to me. When Red Dead Redemption 2 opens, the Vandaling gang are stuck in a blizzard as they hide from the law in the mountains. In the first mission, you, as Arthur, and Dutch slowly trek through the snow in search for supplies. In the second mission, you and Javier slowly climb the mountain ranges, on horseback and on foot, to find John. Shortly afterwards, you and Charles go quietly hunting for deer. The sixth mission consists entirely of riding a wagon and talking to Charles and Hosea, only stopping briefly to fix a wheel. Basically what I'm trying to say is that the game's first chapter is very slow. Of the six missions, only two have lengthy gunfights, another two have brief combat sequences, one with wolves and the other with human enemies, and the other two have no combat whatsoever, focusing entirely on the narrative and dialogue. This type of approach to a game, especially a high budget action adventure game from Rockstar, is bold, and it most certainly does not work for everyone. If you want to jump straight into the open world full of gunfights, bounties and lawlessness, this chapter is not for you. It's a long, slow introduction to a lengthy, narrative-driven experience. And I love it. I love the slowness of chapter one. I love that we're given time to connect with the characters instead of being thrown straight into the action. I love that the slow nature of these first missions represents the slow and difficult situation that the gang is experiencing. I love that the tutorial elements of the chapter, and there's a lot of things here for the game to teach you, are integrated into the story with only discrete pop-ups. Of course this isn't for everyone, I could actively point out several reasons why this introduction doesn't work for many people, but I feel like it was made for me. Some of my favourite films ever made are Schindler's List, The Wind Rises, The Revenant, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri, and Marriage Story. Most of these films are pretty long, with one exceeding three hours, but more important than their length is their pacing. Each of them takes time to establish their characters and world, only using action scenes when thematically and narratively relevant. And don't get me wrong, I love a good action blockbuster. Some of my favourite cinema experiences have been watching the new Avengers or Star Wars films. But in terms of what has really had an impact on me and stuck with me years after release, it's these long, slow-paced movies. So when I spent the first two hours of Red Dead Redemption 2 cramped in the snow with my fellow gang members, the people I'd spend the next 50 or so hours with, rest assured I was happy. I didn't even know that you couldn't roam the open world in the first chapter until I read about it online afterwards. I was already so engrossed in these characters and their stories, I didn't feel the need to go off and explore the world. All I wanted to do was follow the long, slow-paced story of the Vandaling Gang. So that's what I did. Even back in 2010, Dutch Vandalin was one of the most interesting video game characters. A man who turned from a charismatic leader of a gang, a father figure to many of its members to a murderer who stops at little to ensure his own survival. We can see from his final speech that he's not a stupid man. He's eloquent and intelligent, he knows how people work, and his warning to John is a critical and accurate one. When I'm gone, they'll just find another monster. They have to. 
because they have to justify their wages. He has an underlying intelligence and charisma that makes his former leadership status seem valid. But what turned him into this murderer? And what tore his gang apart? That Rockstar was willing to answer this question and risk damaging the legacy of the original Red Dead Redemption is brave and a testament to its writing style. But they did it, and dare I say, they nailed it. The competition in this game alone is too fierce to say for certain, but Dutch in Red Dead Redemption 2 is one of my favourite video game characters. And not because I like him as a person, he's too ignorant and impatient and narcissistic for that, but because of his development over the course of the game. Or rather, you could even say that I like him for his lack of development in some cases. He repeatedly makes mistakes by the end of the game, but even at the start of the first chapter, it's clear that he started to lose focus. At the Blackwater heist before the events of the game, Dutch shot an innocent young woman. His second-in-command, Hosea, admits that he'd already begun to lose faith in Dutch and their mission. In one of the early missions, Dutch wants to go after his archenemy, Colmo Driscoll. When Arthur confronts him, asking if the mission is simply for revenge, Dutch assures him that it's not, and Arthur follows his leader. You always said revenge is a luxury we can't afford. This is the right call, Arthur. I think this scene is paralleled well with the final mission of Chapter 6, where Arthur pleads Dutch to rescue Abigail, and Dutch refuses. In this scene, Arthur is no longer the concerned brother questioning his motives. He's the desperate son begging for help, praying that the father he once knew and loved was still in there. Touch! Clearly, he was not, so Arthur leaves. And as much as that parallel might show a development in Dutch, more than that I think it shows the development in Arthur. No longer is he listening to Dutch's excuses and validating them to himself. No longer is he letting Dutch get in his ear and persuade him that his choices are the right ones. Having seen Dutch's true colours, Arthur is making those decisions himself. What I love about this game and its characters too, is that these developments aren't restricted to just the main players either. It's not just Dutch and Arthur, we get to see John Marston's development from a lost gunslinger to a dedicated family man. Sadie Adler grows from a grieving widow to an effective bounty hunter. On the opposite end of the spectrum, we see Karen Jones go from an underestimated thief to a depressed drunk. And we even get to see Uncle go from simple laziness to... Lombago! Every character in the game has some form of development and character building, whether it's shown in the main story or the side missions, and it truly makes each and every one of them feel real and alive. Rockstar gives enough time for each character to grow, and I think the aforementioned pacing plays a big role in that. To me, it feels like a book. We're not just rushing from moment to moment, like plenty of movies and other games, nor are the quiet moments simple filler to save on budget, like in several television shows. Instead, the game gives us time to see each of the characters and build their stories without any interruption of the main events. As someone who loves reading books but seldom finds time to do so, this is the kind of storytelling that I love. It makes the characters, and the world, feel more alive. By the time I was done witnessing the story of the Vandalin gang, I was finally ready to really explore the open world. Yes, that's right, I didn't truly start my free roaming experience until after the credits had rolled. I was so caught up in the game's story and characters, and I was so worried that I would accidentally spoil the game's ending for myself online, I just had to see it through by myself. I stuck primarily to the main missions and had finished the main game within a few days of release. It wasn't until my second playthrough of the game that I allowed myself to explore the open world and complete more side content with Arthur. Is this the best way to play through the game? Absolutely not. Do I regret it? Not necessarily. When I first watched Arthur die, I was shocked and upset. I'd grown to love this character over the last few days, and he'd finally begun to redeem his awful actions when his life came to an end. But by the time I watched Arthur die the second time, I was devastated. I watched him save the family of the man he killed. I watched him not only absolve the debt, but help to fund the life of a grieving widow. I watched him admit his fear of death to Sister Calderon. This time, I hadn't just watched Arthur help out the Native Americans and doubt Dutch a couple of times. I witnessed Arthur in his most vulnerable moments, helping those in need without even asking for a thanks. This is his redemption. The game's narrative was improved and had a stronger impact on me simply by me exploring the open world. And by allowing myself time to appreciate the game's open world, I started to fall in love with the game's other aspects as well. Allow me to elaborate. I was lucky enough to grow up with acreage, and as a curious child all I wanted to do was explore. 
My siblings and I would spend hours wandering around the fields and bushes, looking for interesting plants or lost treasures. We'd search around the back of the oval at the school next door and sneak through the backyards of our neighbours to make our way home. We were young children looking for something to do, and exploring new areas was as exciting as anything. Many years later, as an adult, and I hadn't made this connection until very recently, I wanted to find another world to explore, a virtual one. I wanted to get lost in a game world that could engross me for weeks. I considered some MMORPGs, but I've never really clicked with online multiplayer games. I played through Nino Kuni 2, and it was an enjoyable game, but not quite what I was after. Marvel Spider-Man was an engrossing experience, but the world is still New York City, so there's not really anywhere to lose yourself. But in Red Dead Redemption 2, when you first visit Valentine and you can practically smell the farm animals, when you travel to Rhodes and you can sense the tensions of the Greys and the Braithwaites, when you finally enter Saint Denis and you can basically feel the humidity and smell the factories, it feels... real. In a way, I'm glad I never went exploring the open world any earlier, because visiting each area as the story progressed added a deeper level of mystery and grandeur. I was seeing these towns for the first time with Arthur, even the small areas that you don't see as much are incredibly detailed and feel alive. The mining town of Annisburg, the Van Horn Trading Post, Emerald Ranch, the Wapiti Indian Reservation, Strawberry, La Gras. Even beyond the named areas though, every single corner of this map has something unique and interesting to discover. I remember the first time I stumbled across the abandoned town of Pleasance in Le Moyne. I was immediately drawn to the graves, and it quickly became clear that something terrible had gone down. I explored the different buildings, trying to piece together the mystery of this place. But whether or not you discover the answer is irrelevant. The game never tells you what happened, nor does it reward you for finding clues. Because this wasn't part of the story, it's part of the world building. The same goes for, say, the logging camp in West Elizabeth, which develops as the world does, being completely empty in 1907. Or even small abandoned houses dotted throughout the world, like this one in New Hanover, with only a dead family and a couple of clues, which I only found for the first time recently after almost two years of playing the game. These areas aren't necessarily relevant to the narrative in any way. In fact, there's a fair chance that most players never even notice them during their playthroughs. But Rockstar knows that we're suckers for exploration, so they filled this world with secrets for us to find, evidence that people once lived in these places. And as a result, the world feels alive. Not only does it feel alive, but it looks alive. I don't think it's hyperbole to say that Red Dead Redemption 2 was the best looking game I've ever played. Naughty Dog has character detail and animation perfected, and their landscapes are incredible, but man, Red Dead Redemption 2 is next level. I could take a screenshot at any moment throughout the game and frame it on my wall. I've taken up so much space on my PS4 just with pictures and videos of the game. I'm not even a good photographer or anything, I just take screenshots when I think the background looks pretty. And a lot of videos like this. Who is it? Arthur, if you showed these gameplay screenshots to me even back in 2016 when the game was first announced, I don't know if I would have believed it. This is what I've been waiting for games to look like. This is what the leaked GTA 5 gameplay videos tried to look like back in 2011, though you could always tell they were fake straight away by the clunky character animation and awkward camera movement. Because Rockstar just has a level of detail and perfectionism that's present in everything that they do, and it's so especially clear in this game. Nowhere is this level of polish clearer than in Red Dead Redemption 2's game world. But even the animation, the gameplay, the story, the music, it's all so well done, and really makes the experience feel more alive. Like with reading books, I struggle to find much time to listen to music. If I'm working on a project, I simply can't listen to songs with lyrics. The words become the focus of my thoughts and I can't concentrate on my work, so I tend to listen to soundtracks. Video game soundtracks, to be more precise. If I'm working on a project about a video game, as I often do, then the soundtrack will become all I listen to for that period of time. Safe to say, I've listened to the Red Dead Redemption, L.A. Noir, The Last of Us, and Uncharted 4 soundtracks far too many times for any sane human. I could probably recite songs from the games better than I can actual moments from the stories. With Red Dead Redemption 2 then, I was in for a treat. Not only did the magnificent musician Woody Jackson provide hours upon hours of instrumental score to complement the gameplay and cutscenes, but the brilliant producer Daniel Lanois helped to give us a whole soundtrack's worth of vocal tracks. It's incredible. I'm a little ashamed to admit that I hadn't really heard the music of D'Angelo prior to playing the game, but after listening to Unshaken, of course it became my mission to familiarise myself with his stellar work. Same goes for Rhiannon Giddens and Willie Nelson, 
artists that I was aware of but not particularly familiar with, now I could easily list them among my favourites. I've heard some occasional remarks that, though the actual quality of the songs and performers are among the best of any video game, their placement within the story doesn't feel as effective and that it's trying too hard to imitate the musical moments from the first game. It would be foolish to deny that entering Mexico to Jose Gonzalez's Far Away was the major inspiration for the musical moments in Red Dead Redemption 2. I was always more of a fan of Jamie Liddell's compass playing as you ride back to see your family, personally. But I can't agree that the second game fails to match these moments. If anything, I think it surpasses them. I've heard one or two people complain that that's the way it is, playing during Arthur's final ride feels too melodramatic especially compared to John's silent final stand in the first game. And to that I say, yeah, it is more melodramatic, but we've spent more than twice the amount of time with Arthur than with John. We've watched him develop from a hardened criminal to a man of sacrifice, and for the last 10 or so hours we've watched his health slowly decline anyway. Unlike with John, we know that Arthur is dying, so let's be melodramatic and cry about it. We deserve this. And that's the way it is as a perfect swan song for this character. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. I can make a whole video just about that. Speaking of making a whole video about one thing, Woody Jackson's score. It's so incredibly haunting in some places and triumphant in others. There are themes for different characters in different locations and different types of gameplay. It's so varied and yet so fitting to the game at all times. I could easily double the length of this video just by talking about this score. Not only does it fit the narrative and characters, but it enhances the gameplay in so many ways. Whether you're quietly riding through a town, or shooting up a rival gang, or speeding through fields with your horse, it always fits so well. They even know when not to use music, and how powerful moments of silence can be. The gameplay is definitely enhanced by the music. Everything is. It's so incredibly well done, and still sticks with me two years later. I remember really liking video games growing up. One of the first games I ever remember seeing was Sonic the Hedgehog 2 for the Mega Drive. I fell in love with Crash Bandicoot growing up based on my early childhood memories. And I always loved watching my siblings play The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time over many, many hours. But that's the thing, I loved watching them play. I only recently realized that I don't actually know how many hours I've played of Ocarina of Time, but it's likely far less than it feels like. I feel like I finished that game at least half a dozen times. I remember so many little secrets from it, so many interesting locations, but chances are I probably barely put my hands on the controller in that game. And it's not because I didn't like playing, I just think that I was able to get enough satisfaction and entertainment by watching my siblings play, so I didn't really feel the need to play it myself. Even when we played multiplayer games like 4 player Mario Kart 64, I was usually the 5th player. Whoever came 4th would have to swap with me, and unless we're playing Toad's Turnpike there's a fair chance that we'd swap back before long anyway. It wasn't really until the announcement of Grand Theft Auto V in 2011 that I became interested in playing games for myself. Maybe it was the hype around the game, or the reputation of Rockstar, or maybe just the fact that the game looked good, but I really wanted it. So for my birthday in early 2013, I got an Xbox 360, and I finally caught up on some of the games that I'd missed. LA Noir, Portal 2, Bioshock, Grand Theft Auto 4, Batman Arkham City, Red Dead Redemption, Mafia 2, Max Payne 3. All fantastic games for many different reasons, but out of all of those games, four in particular really stood out to me. And surprise surprise, they're all published by Rockstar. I knew I'd love LA Noire from the first time I saw a YouTube masthead ad for it in 2011. The concept and setting were so intriguing to me. You solve crimes as a cop from the 1940s and a game published by the same people as Grand Theft Auto. This had to be good, and it was. The story was fascinating, the gameplay, while a little clunky at times, was enjoyable, and the world, though lacking in actual things to do, was so large and impressive. Surprisingly though, what hooked me the most was the characters. I wanted to keep solving traffic cases because I wanted to see if Bukowski would eventually warm up to Phelps. I was fascinated with the homicide cases, not only because of their historical connections, but because I wanted to hear more about Rusty's razor, and if Galloway would eventually lighten up. I was intrigued throughout the arson desk because I could tell that Biggs had a soft heart beneath his toughened appearance and I wanted to see that explored. 
and throughout the whole game I was engaged in Cole Phelps and his story. I wanted to hear more of his thoughts and find out more about his past, and I wanted to find out where his story was going. I played for the concept and story, but I stayed for the characters. <laughs> really know what I was getting into when I played Grand Theft Auto 4. I'd roamed around the worlds of Vice City and San Andreas in the past, and I knew the first San Andreas missions like the back of my hand, but I'd never really taken the time to play through the story. I don't think I would have been alone there either. While the stories are well written and enjoyable to play, I don't think it's the main reason a lot of people play GTA games. So imagine my surprise when I played Grand Theft Auto 4. To this day, I still think it's one of the most memorable video game stories ever. It tends to drag on a little, especially around the middle where it feels like the overall narrative isn't really advancing, but even these moments are incredibly entertaining and well written. The whole time, I'm fascinated to see the story of Roman and Nico, and if they might achieve the American dream they so strongly desire. I'm pushed along by my interest in Dimitri, and hopefully getting the chance to finally get revenge. And of course, I want to know if Nico will find the special someone he's looking for the man who betrayed his unit 15 years prior. And it all culminates in one of the most memorable endings of any game, at least to me, regardless of which of the two endings you might get. The story of GTA 4 is incredible, and the fact that it's a GTA game makes it even more so. The original Red Dead Redemption, like other Rockstar games, is known for getting a lot of things right. The characters, the graphics, the gameplay, the music, and they're all great. But they'd all be irrelevant if not for the vast open world. After basically writing the book on open world games with GTA 3 in 2001, and tweaking it slightly over the years that followed, it felt like Rockstar rewrote it again in 2010 with Red Dead Redemption. Exploring the open world feels like living in a western film, or better yet, living in the United States and Mexico in 1911. Each of the areas are so iconic. New Austin is full of small towns and outposts representing a developed nation. Nuevo Paraiso includes Mexican army forts and rebel outposts representing a province on the brink of war. And West Elizabeth is an advanced nation representing the civilized areas of the developing world. And each of these areas feature NPCs who fit perfectly. I don't even think that GTA 5, which released more than three years later, managed to feel as real as Red Dead Redemption does. The world is incredible. I did not expect to like Max Payne 3 as much as I did. It's a Rockstar game, so I knew it would have a certain level of polish and the writing would be solid, but it's a third-person shooter, Rockstar's first non-open world console game since Manhunt 2, and the third game in a series that hadn't seen an entry in almost nine years. It was almost destined to fail. Yet in my eyes, it did the opposite. I was blown away with how enjoyable the game is. The gameplay feels so clean, so polished. I never had so much fun in a game where all you do is shoot. It wasn't easy, I died a lot, but it never felt impossible. The addition of the cover system mixed with the updates to the bullet time mechanic makes the game so much easier to play. And it's so much fun. I think it was the first Rockstar game that I ever played through twice. For a series that feels so centered on its stories, which are always incredibly entertaining, Max Payne 3 shocked me with the addictiveness of its gameplay. So after finally playing through all of these games from Rockstar, I was left with high expectations for their future products. I waited for Grand Theft Auto V with great anticipation, and of course bought it on launch day in September 2013. It was fantastic and lived up to all my expectations at the time, but in the years since then it's failed to leave as strong of an impact as Rockstar's other games. It's a great game, don't get me wrong, there's a reason it's the second best selling game of all time, but I feel like I have more memories of watching the trailers and reading previews than I do of the game itself. It just fails to feel as memorable all these years later. Fast forward to October 2016. I sat there in the minutes before 11pm, constantly refreshing Rockstar's Twitter page in the hopes of an official announcement. It finally came, and the anticipation started again. Who would the characters be? What would the story be like? How big is the world? What new gameplay features will they introduce? Two years after that, the game came out. I thought they nailed it. Two years after that, I still think they did. Rockstar took the characters from a beloved game from 8 years prior and gave them so much more personality and development. They gave it the LA Noir treatment, and I didn't want to stop playing. I wanted to see where the characters would end up. 
They took what could have been a simple cut and paste narrative and turned it into a 40 hour plus experience. The original game already had an incredible story, but they gave it the Grand Theft Auto 4 treatment anyway. And like GTA 4, it has one of the most memorable endings of any game. They took the decades of open world experience that they had under their belt and created the most immersive environment I've ever had the joy of exploring. They rewrote the book yet again, giving the open world the Red Dead Redemption treatment that it didn't even need. And as if the character's story and open world wasn't enough, they took their years of mastering gameplay and mastered it even more. I had high expectations for the gameplay, but I wasn't expecting them to give it the Max Payne 3 treatment. It's not for everyone, but I adore it. The slowness matches the world and the story and I love it. Red Dead Redemption 2 really is the sum of its parts. Rockstar took everything it had learned from all of its previous games. Characters, story, open world, gameplay, music, sound design, art design, animation, everything. And turned it up to 11. I could talk about each of these different elements in their own videos. And honestly, I might at some point. I'm not going to become a Red Dead Redemption 2 channel or anything like that because I have too many other games that I still need to talk about. And this game isn't for everyone. No game is. But still, two years after it released, Red Dead Redemption 2 was perfect. To me.